Did your parents ever have the talk with you? So some of you who are parents, maybe you are, maybe you've already had the talk with your kids, maybe you're getting ready to have the talk with your kids. But if we were to go around the room and to ask, hey, when when you had the talk or when you gave the talk, what was that like? Number one, some of you would probably have some pretty funny stories, uh, uh, but they'd be wildly different, right? Like parents take different approaches to this, so there'd be different content, there'd be different uh, lengths of the conversation, there might be different approaches to how they brought it up, but there would be two things that would be, I want to say, that are universally consistent when the talk happens. Uh, Number one, no one likes it. No one. Parents don't like to give it. Kids don't like to receive it. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. Sure, there might be a funny story to tell years later, but not right then. It is mortifying to everyone that gives the talk or receives the talk. But I want to say there's one other universally consistent fact, and it's that everyone who has matured into adulthood and lived a little bit will say, there are some things that I wish someone would have told me about sex. Yeah? Like, there's probably a point in your life when you said, man, I I wish I would have been aware of that. And it's never like the technical stuff, right? It's always all of the other emotional things and relational things that happen around it. Like, I wish I had known that. Well, this morning, uh, we are going to... Uh, step into a portion of Paul's letter, his first letter to the Thessalonians, uh, where he talks about sex. And I can't promise that there won't be any awkward moments um, this morning, but I will uh, do my best to make sure it wasn't maybe as awkward as the conversation you had with your parents. And uh, hopefully, by the time we're done, uh, maybe you hear some things that you are um, glad that you got to experience this morning. Children's ministry is available, by the way. <laughs> but we won't, I, we won't be going, yeah, this won't be like health class, okay? So don't worry about that. All right, well, let's talk about, let's remind you a little bit about the, the Thessalonian context. So this is the context that Paul was writing this letter to. So Thessalonica was a very large city with... Uh, Uh, Well, it's it's just like any city today, right? A large city has many different philosophies, many different religions, and and Thessalonica was certainly like that. And we know from Acts 17 that when Paul went to Thessalonica, uh, so he always starts with the synagogues, he starts with the Jews, who, of course, have this foundation of the Old Testament, and they're waiting for the Messiah, and he comes to them first to tell them, hey, the Messiah has come. And a lot of cases when Paul went uh, into those places, like there were, there were Jews who were accepting of the message. But in Thessalonica, we read that a small number of Jews were accepting of the message, but a large number of the Greeks were receptive of the message. And so a large portion of this church was made up of Greeks. And Paul got to spend just a few days with them, uh, teaching them and instructing them before he got ran out of town. Uh, by some of the other Jews that weren't really excited about what he was saying. So in many ways, the church at Thessalonica was starting at ground zero. And that includes ground zero on the topic of sex. So it, it wasn't uncommon for a Greek man, even a Greek married man, to have multiple sexual partners. So like this is very different than the Jewish culture. This is very different than this new early Christian culture that Paul and the other apostles are, are spreading and are instituting in the churches that they're planting. So let's, uh, let's pick up First Thessalonians where uh, Paul begins to unpack this. So Rebecca, uh, give me First Thessalonians 4 verses 1 through 3. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. So this, this is his first letter. So these instructions would have come, that Paul's referring to, would have come during that time when he was with them for three days. We instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. 
Now we ask you and urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. So Paul's like, listen, we, we, we have asked you and instructed you how to live a life that pleases God. And now is like the next step. You need to live into this more and more to live a life pleasing to God. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. So let's back up to that that sanctified word just real quick. It's God's will for you to be sanctified. So we get really caught up sometimes in trying to figure out what God's will for my life is. And usually when we're talking about that, we're meaning things like, where does God want me to live? Where does God want me to work? Uh, What activities does God want me to participate in? That whole kind of shebang. Um, and so we, we very re- easily kind of focus there. But this is one of just a couple places in Scripture that very clearly says that this is what God wants for you. God's will is that you would be holy. I think that's the first blank maybe on, on your insert. God's will is that you would be holy. That's what sanctified means. This is how we live a life pleasing to God, that we would be holy, that we'd be sanctified. So sometimes when we talk about holiness, like we put all of our attention on, we, we got to stay away from sin. We got to stay away from sin, stay away from the bad stuff. And, and that's a part of it. Like that's not avoidable. But we have to view it through the proper motivation. Because if we have an improper motivation, like we don't become holy. Uh, we just become prudes and snobs. And unfortunately, we probably know a number of Christians who are less holy. At least they think they're holy, but they're more like prudes and snobs. And that's not who God calls us to. See, our motivation for pursuing holiness and staying away from those sinful traps is because we want to please God. It's because we pursue a deeper relationship with Jesus so that through the inner work of the Holy Spirit, our love and devotion to him is greater than our desire for the things of the world. That's what living a holy life, that's what living a pleasing life to God is in a nutshell. Like, we fall in love with Jesus. And so maybe that's, maybe that's a new thought for you. Like, you've, you've known, like, we need to believe in Jesus, we need to believe in what he says and who he is and what he did. But it's not just believing in him, it's, it's falling in love with him. Like when we talk about having a relationship with Jesus, that's not just surface level kind of babble. I mean, we, mean, we mean falling in love with him, who he is, what he did, and what he's about. And, and when we have that motivation for living a holy life, that brings everything, the rest of it, into focus. That's what gives our, catches our eye. Like, I, I'm not following the rules. I'm not listening to these guidelines because I'm, I'm a, I'm, I toe the line, right? It's, it's because I love Jesus. And I want to please Jesus with every aspect of my life. So Paul says, it's the will of God for you to be holy. And there's one specific context that he chooses to highlight in this passage for how they should be holy. Verses three through four. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. It's God's will for you to be holy, and specifically, he wants you to be holy by being sexually pure by avoiding sexual immorality. So given the culture that we just talked about, that most of the Thessalonian church would have been brought up in, like we can see why this would be the important point to highlight, right? Like, listen, you guys are doing good, and you've, of course, you've come up in this Greek culture, but you're, you're doing good at pleasing God and following him. But man, there's, there's this thing that has been ingrained in you throughout your life with just the way the world has been for you. And this is your next step. So from the first couple of verses, we know that Paul is referring to previous instructions he'd given them. 
And it would be really nice <laughs> if we had that written out, wouldn't it? Like, it'd be really nice if we knew every conversation that Paul had had with all these churches he planted, and we could say, oh, yeah, this is what he means. So, so like, the, we asked the question, like, okay, what do we mean by sexual immorality? Like, that's kind of a broad term. And it turns out the word that uh, Paul uses in the Greek, like, it, it has some different applications, and it can be translated different ways in different contexts, but kind of the root of them sort of boils down to the same thing. So for this morning, let's just use this definition for sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is any sexual experience outside the umbrella of relational permanence. Permanence, which is marriage. Now I know, so I know the pushback, right? Like, well, marriage ain't what it used to be. And when we look at our culture, marriage does not seem very permanent anymore, which is true. Like, there's no denying that. Like, when you look around the world, marriage does not seem uh, very permanent. You don't have to look any further than the ways that younger generations talk about it. Like, every once in a while, we'll have a teen at youth group whose parents are going through a divorce their parents are married, and they will say, my parents are breaking up. Like, that's different kind of language, isn't it? And that captures a different sort of, of reality. So marriage does not have that level of permanence, but, but Christian marriage should. And it would be really nice to talk about that, but that is a different sermon. <laughs> and so that's not the one we're talking about today. So uh, I, I, got, I, don't know how that, I don't know how that definition strikes you. Um, it's very different than what we hear most people say. It might be different than what you've experienced in your life. And so you might sort of find yourself asking, okay, well, why does this matter? Like, why? Why is this a thing? Why does this matter? Why is it there? You might even be thinking, can we just stop talking about it now? <laughs> but let's just take a moment to, um, let's just consider. Let's take a moment and consider um, the, the viewpoint that Paul is sort of expounding uh, related to some of the viewpoints that we just see uh, commonly in the world and how, how the two relate to each other. So first, uh, and these are on your insert, sex is always relational, always relational. So Paul points this out in verse 6. So give me a verse 6, Rebecca. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother. This is directly related to the sexual immorality verse. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. When we misuse sex, we can dishonor others. There's a huge relational component to sex. And I know some of you are thinking, we're not 40-year-olds. Like, of course there's a relational component to sex. Like, that's, that's the thing, Right? So I know, like, like no duh. But uh, let, let's, let's be honest for a moment. There, there are some sexual experiences, such as viewing pornography, that can easily be seen as transactional and not relational. And it's very easy to see why someone would have that viewpoint, doesn't it? We can have this opinion that, okay, this is just a transaction, not an actual relational component. But you probably know of a relationship or a marriage that went through serious trauma because of, because of pornography or infidelity. Like, that wouldn't be the case if this were purely transactional. It affects how we relate to the people we love the most and the people we will love the most. Like, th there's layers to it. I mean, we could even talk about how our own personal holiness relates to our brothers and sisters in Christ in the church and how that affects and impacts and relates to one another. We don't have time to, to dig that far deep right here. But it's all relational. Like holiness for as much as it's about our relationship with God, it's also about our relationship with each other. 
And for sex to, to impact that uh, it means it, it impacts all of our relationships. And so this is closely tied uh, to the second viewpoint on your uh, message notes. Sex is more than just physical. It impacts us emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. So the spiritual impact is right there in the passage. Like Paul relates sexual immorality to our holiness, to our ability to be holy, to our life that is pleasing to God. How we use sex affects us spiritually at every level. So there's, so there's a notion that, like it's, it's been around forever, that, that sex is just one way or a way to satisfy and appease a physical appetite we have. It's no different than having a cheeseburger when you're hungry. And so that notion has been around forever. It was around then, it's around today. But we all know it isn't true. And I want to say even the people who have that viewpoint know it's not true. And the most uncomfortable way to show that it's not true is when it comes to sexual abuse. So people who have been sexually abused, they're left with a deep, deep trauma that isn't just physical. goes to the core of who they are. It affects how they relate to other people. It affects how they love other people. It affects them emotionally. It, is, it affects them mentally. It affects them spiritually. If this were just a physical transaction, like we just talked about, that wouldn't be the case. The act is so much more than physical. And in its most worse evil form, it is completely and utterly devastating to us at every level. But at its best, at its best and purest and most beautiful form, it has this incredibly beautiful effect on us because we have an appetite for intimacy. So intimacy and sex, those are words that are often lumped together and and they shouldn't be equated with each other because they don't mean the same thing. But, But they are linked to one another. Genuine intimacy is about fully knowing and being fully known by someone else. And when sex is at its best, we experience that sort of deep intimacy. Like these are things that don't usually get, get addressed until there's a problem. And this is at the root of it. How we treat sex and impacts our ability to experience relational intimacy. And we separate it from relational permanence, our ability to be genuinely intimate with someone is affected. I want to say it becomes dull. Our ability to be relationally intimate becomes dull. And so we undermine one of our deepest desires and one of our deepest needs, which is this real and genuine intimacy, this desire for someone to so thoroughly know us and love us. When we misuse sex, we we undermine all of that and we dull our ability to experience it. Friends, it's so much more than physical. It impacts us at these deeper levels and, and when things blow up, we're left with emotional, mental, and spiritual baggage that we just can't lay aside, that we have to go through a process to deal with. So first and finally, uh, Sex is not the pinnacle of human experience. Sex is not the pinnacle of human experience. So this is one of the really broken ways our world thinks about it. So there's this notion that you can't experience the greatest depths of love or we can't experience genuine intimacy unless we're having sex. That's just not true. Our deepest and truest experiences of love and intimacy come in our relationship with Christ. It's union with him through growing holiness in our lives that enables us to have a deep and rich experience of love and intimacy. So listen, this just needs to be said to some of you. Friends, if, if you're single or divorced 
or widowed or in a marriage where sex is not a possibility, your experience of love and relational intimacy is not hampered by a lack of sex in your life. So in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about singleness, which Paul would have understood singleness as a sexless life. But Paul refers to singleness as a gift. It's a gift because you can experience love and intimacy in meaningful ways that aren't always drawn back to and aren't always fixed on the physical aspects and the physical experience. If, you're not, if you aren't having sex, you are not less than. You are not incomplete. You are not less of a human. You are not incapable of experiencing the greatest depths of love and intimacy that we can. There are higher and greater things in this life than sex. And there are a lot of voices that would like to argue otherwise, but, but they're wrong. Because we believe there is something more. So all of this, like all of this, would have been a, a much different view than what the Thessalonians were used to. But, but I, I hope you see what, what Paul's doing here. For Paul, these, these weren't just rules that he wanted them to keep. These guidelines were a benefit to them. A benefit to them. He wasn't anti-sex. Like, like, how could he be? God designed it. God made it. It's a part of his creation. It's, he intends for it to be a part of human experience. If the Thessalonians were going to get married, then Paul wanted them to have a satisfying sexual experience. And when we view sex rightly and lay, in, lay aside the entanglements of our history or our culture, we find something way better way better than the world has to offer. We, we find the sex that God designed. So maybe like the Thessalonians, this might be a, a very different view for you, and, and, it, and it might be a difficult word. Like you're like, ah, I don't know. I don't know what I make of all that. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, when the three of us, the three pastors were up here talking, one of the things I said when we were talking about preaching, is that uh, preaching is a conversation. Like especially messages that you hear that are, that are difficult to digest. That, that's an invitation to a conversation uh, with one of us, with any of us. And so, so maybe that, that's what you need to do, a conversation between you and God, but also a conversation between one of us. You know, at the beginning of the, of the section of Scripture we looked at, Paul referenced twice, instructions that he'd given them previously. So this isn't the first time Paul had talked to them about some of this stuff. This isn't their first conversation about it. There's a process to untangling the ways we've always thought and untangling the experiences we've had in anything. To be holy, to live a life pleasing to God, and to choose a different way when it comes to following Jesus. And so maybe today's the day that, that you want to choose a different way. So this is really the bottom line. The path to pleasing God and experiencing real intimacy, living a loved life, and even satisfying sex is holiness. It's holiness. Holiness.